Uh, I sure count it a privilege to be with you. I mean that seriously. It's, uh, it's uh, in my heart, this is it right here. Um, you're going to hear me talk. Some of you will hear me talk tomorrow. And one of the things I hit is we're losing 50 to 88 percent of our youth. 50 to 88 percent of the youth raised in the church age 18 are gone. I started hitting this about two years ago, three years ago, where I really started hitting dads. 50 to 88 percent of the kids are walking away. And then I had dads coming up to me and talking and saying, you know, you're right. And Obama, you know, he's doing all this stuff and he's messing everything up. And the schools, and they're doing this and they're messing everything up. And, and, and it just started hitting me. You know what? The problem in the White House, the problem in the church house, the problem in the schoolhouse, the problem is you're in my house. And so this morning, what I'm going to do is come after you guys and, and, and just hit you with dads. It's time. It's time. We've got to get serious about the fact that we're losing 50 to 88 percent of our kids, and we've got to, we got to look, uh, look at the man in the mirror and say, you know what? Not on my dime. Not anymore. It's not, it's not the government. It's not the... No, no, no. If we start in our house, things will change. And so, uh, new ministry. Some of you said you saw me speak before uh, at the Free Church. It was with Answers in Genesis, and uh, now I've gone. I've started a new ministry called Reasons for Hope, and a part of the reason that I did leave was because of this right here. Men and youth. That's where what, that's what I'm going. I'm going after men and youth with a real emphasis on evangelism. Now, reasons for hope. There's lots of reasons for hope. I mean, the fact that we got a really good breakfast this morning, there's hope in that. Uh, the fact that we have homes, there's hope in that. The fact, hey, we got bank accounts. Uh, the fact that uh, people want our autograph. If you sell out for anything that the world can give you, the world can and will take it away. There's only one thing that nobody can take away from you, and that's Jesus Christ. And that's where our real reason for hope is, and that's why the asterisk always leads to the answer. Now, I want to show you a video of what, uh, what I'm trying to accomplish over the next few days that I have the privilege of being with you all. So it's just a little short video, just kind of get you thinking. My friends, I'm writing to let you know that whether you like it or not, you're in a war zone. There's an enemy seeking to destroy you, and his allies are always coming after you. Believe me when I say the battle requires everything you got. Mental fortitude, physical prowess, and above all else, a prayerful dependence on the King who has faithfully given you everything you need for the spiritual power, knowledge, and understanding it will take for you to prevail. I beg you to continually read His Word. His strategy is perfect. And even though the war has already been won, don't let that knock you off guard and lead you into complacency. There is an urgency to all of this, and we have a commandment to follow. Now. And this is very important. When you're out there, remember you're not fighting against flesh and blood, so don't get sidetracked or pulled into useless sparring matches. Stay the course. Since we fight differently than others, we'll be treated differently. Keep your eyes and ears open because we're being fired on from all directions. Be on the lookout, especially for spiritual and mental attacks. The enemy's ammunition is deceit, doubt, and fear, and it's launched strategically in the things we see, hear, and read. He is a wicked influencer and he moves people to hurl vicious attacks on us and he'll do everything he can to destroy the foundation of our faith and blind us so we don't help others. Stay bold, stay true, remain sober-minded, hold closely the authentic word so you can spot the counterfeit immediately and demolish it. Don't fall for age-old tricks or sleight of hand misdirection. It's all fake and empty. Stand firm on the king's foundation. Go the distance, fight the good fight. I know it's not easy, but now is not the time to run and hide. It's time to proclaim the truth and live by it. It's time to be ready and willing to boldly run forward with the gospel of peace as your inspiration. In one hand, you hold the impenetrable shield of faith, and in the other, the sword. Strike down arguments, ideas, and causes against the king. Be wise and make the most of every opportunity. And lastly, my friends, be prepared to answer people who genuinely want to know where your hope comes from in the midst of all this. They're in this war too, but they don't have the hope you do. Try to remember what that was like. Help them. Teach them the way. I wish I could have written about something entirely different. In fact, that's what I started out to do. But instead, my friends, I was compelled to urge you all to contend. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the fact that you've uh, loved us enough that you died on a cross for us, that God, you... You did not leave us here alone. You, 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 you have empowered each and every one of us to do amazing things that you, Lord, we know will be the one that does the, those amazing things. You've just given us the privilege of being along for the ride. So, 
Lord, you turned the world upside down with 12. There's more than 12 here today, so I'm praying that you would turn this community upside down, that you would turn our nation upside down, that God, uh, through humble fallen servants, and that's what we are, you are our master, we are your servant, that God, you would do something amazing, even today. So help me to speak the truth, help me to be obedient to your word, to uh, lift you up, not self. And we thank you, Father, for what you will accomplish in Jesus' name. Amen. So, dads, it's time. That's kind of where I'm going with this. It's, it's time. And there's a couple of different type meetings with that it's time thing. Number one, it's time. We've got to invest in our younger, in our young generation. You know, here's a quote that I read, and, I, and I've, it's stuck with me for a while now, and it's just been in my head. The average time a child, this is not the quote, the average time a child spends... Uh, in school is 900 hours a year. 900 hours a year is the average time a youth spends in the school system, okay, whether that's public, private, home school. 900 hours a year. Um, that same child will spend 1,064 hours in front of a TV set. Are you seeing a problem with just those two numbers? Um, if you want to start going into internet, you want to start going into music and video game, then the numbers get really ugly, okay? But just as a minimum, 900 hours a year, Average child spends in a government school system, um, 1,064 in front of a TV set. Here's the quote. The average time a child spends a meaningful conversation with their parents each week is less than 10 minutes. Are you with me? Less than 10 minutes of meaningful conversation with their parents each week. We're losing 50 to 88% of our youth, and we're sitting here wringing our hands. I don't understand. What's wrong? Why are, why, why are we losing all the youth? I don't understand. Well... If you spend less than 10, uh, 10 minutes of significant, meaningful conversation with your children each week, who's having those conversations? Who's doing the teaching? It's time. By the way, I didn't give you the full quote. Let me give you the rest of the quote. If you remove the mother, you can measure this statistic in seconds. Dads, there's one thing that we can take with us to heaven. Our wives should already be going there. It's not our bank accounts. It's not our toys. It's not our job titles. It's our children. And so dads, one of the first things I want to stress to you today is it's time. We've got to spend time with them, but then it's also time that we get serious about dealing with it. You see, that's why I, I, I just believe from what I'm seeing and traveling that we just got to be straight with each other. Some of you may not be fathers. Some of you are future fathers. I'm praying that at least this will be a challenge to you to get serious. And one of the things that I think helps me to recognize this is the fact that we understand what our children really are and what a gift they are, what a blessing they are. You know, I, I, and I mean no disrespect. I was reading your newspaper, uh, the something Republican, okay, Times Republican, and I'm not sure which day it was because there were two editions in the hotel when I checked in, but the front page of one of them talked about uh, the miracle baby coming home. Baby, what is it, uh, baby... I forget the name, but it, it was a headline, Miracle Baby Comes Home. And you know what hit me as I read that? And I mean, no disrespect. Look at your own child. Every child is a miracle. Every Life is a miracle. I mean, when you look at the human body, we are every one of us a miracle. So, so don't get caught up in, oh, well, this is something amazing. No, the fact that you are born is amazing. That's a miracle. Now, praise God that whatever happened there and she was able to come home, he was able to come home because I didn't get to read the article. I didn't have my glasses on. So all I could read was a headline. <laughs> That's all I, I, I got to get my glasses. But guys, they're all a miracle. Psalm 127.3 says, Behold, children are heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. I mean, when we get that proper perspective, when we get that perspective that our children are a reward, they're not a burden, oh my goodness. So many times we can give that, they're a burden. No, our children are a blessing. They're a reward from the Lord. Changes everything the way that I start treating them. You see, we have to take seriously our responsibility to be the spiritual heads of our home. And in order to do that, we need to have the proper perspective. And there's only one that's really, as a Christian, it's a biblical perspective. We have to get into the Word. What does God say about this stuff? It doesn't matter what I think you think or anybody else thinks because that's kind of one of the issues that I get is that, well, what do you think, Carl? It doesn't matter what I think. As a Christian, we have to have that authority, that standard, and that standard is the Word of God. And I know that, you know, if you're like me, I don't like instruction manuals. I mean, the only time I read an instruction manual is after I put something together and there's like four or five major looking parts there, and I'm like, okay, 
I must have done something wrong. So then I go read the instruction manual, and that's not always good. Like, uh, this is true. Oh, man. ADD. This is the way it works. Sorry. I live with it. You only got to deal with it for a short time. The other day, my, uh, I got two grandchildren on the way, June and August. I've got one right now. His birthday is July. And then June and August, we got two more granddaughters coming, Lord willing. And uh, my daughter bought a, uh, a, a pop-up crib. You know, one of these pop-up cribs? They're awesome, man. I mean, they're like this, and then you pop it, and it, boom, it's a whole crib. So she brings it over to the house, and we're going to use it for my grandson. And I'm going to tell you what, I almost threw the thing through the window. You pull the arms up, and they're supposed to lock, and, you know, just boom, boom. Finally had to go read the instruction manual. And it was like, you don't push the floor down. You leave the floor up, then you pull the handles up, then they lock, then you push the floor down. I mean, who, I mean I'm like, push it down, pull the handles up, didn't work. Guys, our children come with an instruction manual, even though we may not like to read it. It's the Word. Whoa, there goes my illusions. It's the Word of God. And we've got to get into it. If we, really want to, if we really want to deal with these issues, if we really want to deal with these issues, you see there's a battle going on in the culture today. And we've got to understand what that battle is and what the enemy is because it's time. One of the major issues that I think that I'm seeing is that, let's just name it, the enemy is real, Satan is real, and we start feeling like we're getting weird or something if we talk about Satan. Satan is real. Look at what is going on in our culture. 400 plus thousand churches across the nation of America. 400 plus thousand churches across the nation of America. There's 6,000 first-run theaters approximately 6,000 first-run theaters. Which one is impacting this culture more? 400,000 churches, 6,000 first-run theaters. There's a battle going on. And so dads, if we're going to get serious about this, if we're going to deal with this stuff, we've got to understand there's three things we need to do. We need to become the protector, provider, and priest of our homes. Now, stick with me. People freak out on the priest thing. We'll deal with it. Protector. Huh. What do we need to protect them from? Well, Satan is real. We better know the tools that he's using to impact this culture. If you're losing 50 to 88% of the generation out here, you better know the tools that he's using to get us to where we are today. And one of them is television and movies. Now, this is coming from a guy who went and watched a movie last night. So I'm telling you not to watch movies. No, I'm not. That's between you and the Lord. But dads, I'll put it to you like this, and you grandfathers too. Teach your children how to watch these things. If you're going to allow them to watch them, teach them how to watch them with critical eyes. Catch the teaching, catch the message. Use them as a springboard to conversations to teach your children or grandchildren. If you watch them. If you don't watch them, praise God for that. That's, that's between you and the Lord. It's not my job to tell you to watch or not to watch, but I know this, that we are watching these things right now, and the messages are coming, and we're not catching it, and it's having an impact and an influence. Um, uh, see if you guys know what fundamentalist. This is a fundamentalist quote here. Many of you have already read my writings identifying TV as a new God. There's a little thing I neglected to mention up until now. Television is a major mainstream infiltration of the new satanic religion. Anybody know what fundamentalist wrote that? It's not Jerry Falwell. It's not Pat Robertson. It's a fundamentalist, though. It's a guy named Anton LaVey. Anton LaVey wrote that in a book called The Devil's Notebook. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Carl, that's weirdo, wacko, fringe stuff. Nobody's reading that book. Really. Uh, anybody in here ever hear, heard of a place called Amazon.com? You've heard of Amazon.com. You know they sell books there as well as other things. By the way, they rank the books that they sell. And this is Amazon.com, the ranking for The Devil's Notebook, Number 13,425. Now, you may look at that and say, so what big deal? Amazon sells over 1.8 million books. To be ranked 13,000 out of 1.8 million, that's pretty good. I wish my book were ranked 13,000. Not because of money, but because I think the message is a whole lot better. Uh, you know why I know they sell at least 1.8 million books? Because my book is ranked 1.8 million by the way, the other book that Mr. LaVey wrote is called the uh, Satanic Bible. Ever hear the Satanic Bible? You see, Anton LaVey is the founder of the Church of Satan. He's now dead, but he was the founder of the Church of Satan. And what did his book, the Satanic Bible, teach? Oh, this is, let's just take a look at it. Um, it's some interesting stuff here. 
Satanism is a blatantly selfish, brutal philosophy. It is based on the belief that human beings are inherently selfish, violent creatures, that life is a Darwinian struggle for survival of the fittest, that only the strong survive in the earth will be ruled by those who fight to win the ceaseless competition that exists in all jungles, including those of urbanized society. Does that sound like half of the programming that's on television today? Anybody ever hear of the Hunger Games? Have you heard of the Hunger Games? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody? Oh, most of you have heard of it. You know what the whole philosophy is behind the Hunger Games? There it is. There are, I can't give you the exact number, right? I, I've got it on my computer. I just did this the other day. In the three books of the Hunger Games, approximately 1,124 pages in the three books, okay? Approximately, because I can't remember, but it's right in that area. There are 2,224 pages in the Life Application Bible. How many students and children have read the 1,100 plus pages? How many Sunday school kids have read the 1,100 plus pages of Hunger Games and not read near that in the Word of God? This philosophy is out there. Oh, by the way, by the way, Satanic Bible, weirdo, wacko, fringe stuff, nobody's reading that. Uh, They rank their books number 4,428. By the way, let me put it in perspective for you. Carl, this is weird. Satan, you don't want to talk about the devil. That's bad stuff. No, no, we need to talk about this. He's real, and it's having an impact. Life Application Bible. This is the top-selling Bible, as you and I would know. Uh, They rank their books on Amazon. How did it rank? Uh, Let's scroll down here. Number 4,800. 26. The Satanic Bible was outselling the Life Application Bible when I did this research. Now, I don't know what it is today. I didn't look it up last night. I should have to give you the most accurate numbers, but that's very recently. You don't think that it's having an impact, the Satanic Bible? Anybody know who that is? You ever hear of a singer called Marilyn Manson? Look at who his mentor was, Anton LaVey. Let's take Marilyn Manson's music. Let's take a movie called Natural Born Killers. Let's take a video game called Doom. Ever hear of those? Let's put them in with a bunch of kids, shake it up for a little while, and see what we get, see what kind of response we get. Anybody in here ever heard of a place called Columbine? You've heard of Columbine? Do you understand that the two young men that went in and did what they did, they left videotape on why they were going in and killing their peers? They were absolutely consistent with their worldview. The one young man had a t-shirt on and read Natural Selection. They believed that they had evolved to a higher level. They were killing off the inferiors. By the way, I wonder where that terminology really comes from. Uh, A a term that is used quite a bit is homo superior. They're no longer homo sapien. They have evolved to a higher level. They are homo superior. Where does that kind of terminology come from? Anybody ever hear of the X-Men? X-Men? Guess where that terminology comes from? X-Men because they had evolved to a higher level. And so you had homo sapien, but you had homo superior. And that's what they believed. They were more highly evolved, so they were killing off the inferiors. Oh, by the way, this is weirdo wacko. Nobody's, this isn't impacting people. You can now choose to download a video game and play Super Columbine RPG where you get to choose to be Mr. Klebold or Harris. You get to walk through the school. You get to talk to the students and ask them questions about uh, do you believe in God before you choose to kill them or not. Video games? My son is now doing a talk. My son joined me about a month and a half ago, two months ago, and he's doing a talk because he came to me. I do the talk on the media and the movies and the, you know, television stuff. And my son came to me and he brought me some stuff on uh, video games. And he's like, "Uh, Dad, you need to see this. You need to see this. I told you, ADD. You need to see this, dads. You think video games, there's nothing that you need to be concerned about that area? I want to show you what my son brought to me, what my son brought to me. It's going to take me one second here because I don't even have this added in the talk. He brought this to me. And I told him, I said, no, I can't do this talk. You need to do this talk because I'm not a gamer. I'm like a Mario Kart guy, you know, 
I mean, seriously, it's like, eh, 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 that's it, I'm done. If I've got to push a button, um, I'm out. Well, I can push one button, but if I've got to push two, then I'm really out. So my son brings this to me. And this is the introduction to a video game that's out right now. Isaac and his mother lived alone in a small house on a hill. Isaac kept to himself, drawing pictures and playing with his toys as his mom watched Christian broadcasts on the television. Life was simple, and they were both happy. That was until the day Isaac's mom heard a voice from above. Your son has become corrupted by sin. He needs to be saved. I will do my best to save him, my lord, Isaac's mother replied, rushing into Isaac's room, removing all that was evil from his life. Again, the voice called to her. Isaac's soul is still corrupt. He needs to be cut off from all that is evil in this world and confess his sins. I will follow your instructions, Lord. I have faith in thee, Isaac's mother replied as she locked Isaac in his room away from the evils of the world. One last time, Isaac's mom heard the voice of God calling to her. You've done as I've asked, but I still question your devotion to me to prove your faith. I will ask one more thing of you. Yes, Lord, anything. Isaac's mother begged. To prove your love and devotion, I require a sacrifice. Your son Isaac will be this sacrifice. Go into his room and end his life as an offering to me to prove you love me above all else. Yes, Lord, she replied, grabbing a butcher's knife from the kitchen. Isaac, watching through a crack in his door, trembled in fear. Scrambling around his room to find a hiding place, he noticed a trap door to the basement hidden under his rug. Without hesitation, he flung open the hatch, just as his mother burst through his door and threw himself down into the unknown depths below. The rest of the game is you as Isaac running from your crazy, psychotic Christian mother who's trying to kill you. And at the very end, if you win the game, the way that you win the game is God reaches down with a big old Bible and slaps mama and kills her with the Bible. This is just one cowboy game. You're a preacher. God tells you that the people are so unrepentant there's no salvation for them, so you've got to go out and kill them. When you get into gun battles with people and you're outnumbered, you know what you do? You pull out the Bible. You start reading. The people that are shooting at you, they hear you reading the Word of God. They put their guns down. They listen to you. Then they start feeling remorse for what they've done. You've disarmed them. Now you pull your gun out and shoot them and blow their heads off. Dads, you better know that there's messages coming in these games. We need to protect our children. And if you don't think it's having an impact on the culture, this is America, 400,000 churches across the nation of America. These are the school shootings and stabbings across America from 1996 to 2006. There is an impact. America is the most quote unquote Christian nation on the planet. We got more Christian music, more Christian radio, more Christian shirts, more Christian shoes. We got Christian everything. I mean, think about it. We even got Christian ties. I don't like ties. I don't. I don't like ties at all. I'm gonna give you my theology on ties. You young men, feel free to use it. I don't know if your parents will go for it, but I'll give it to you. When you wear a tie, you are celebrating the curse. That's why I don't like ties. There were no ties prior to Adam sinning. You can't argue with me, can you? And I can show you in Scripture where ties come from. Genesis 4.15, Cain killed his brother. God put a mark on him. Forget about skin color, brother. He stuck him in a tie. That's my theology. I'm sticking with it. We got Christian ties. I mean, we got Christian everything. Then... That's outdated. I haven't updated it. There's a bunch more since 2006. We need to protect our children. TVs and movies, there's messages coming in there. Computer, dads, if your children, and I'm sorry, this may sound very harsh, but if your children have a computer in their room without you having any type of system on there, covenant eyes, uh, you know, be safe. I don't, I don't know what system, but if they don't have some system where they're not 
there's a filter or there's a mechanism where you're checking and seeing where they're going, you're headed for trouble. You're headed for trouble. 40% of teens have visited sexually explicit sites and websites. And it's not even that you got to try it. I did a search the other day and you're like, really? I mean, I was, it was a search on Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. And the stuff that popped up, I'm like, 40% of teens have visited sexually explicit websites, guys. And it's, it gets even worse. I mean, when you start looking at these things, uh, now this one blows me out of the water. Watch this. 47%, 47% of uh, kids who are heavy media users, how do they classify a heavy media user? 16 hours a day of media. 16 hours a day? I'm not even awake 16 hours a day. Get only fair grades or poor academic grades compared with 23% of light media users, which is less than three hours a day. You better be aware of what's coming in because what's coming in is impacting what's in there and what's coming out. Absolutely is. See, we gotta be the protector and the provider. What do I mean by provider? Because we gotta define our terms here. So a provider, what's a provider? One who provides, furnishes, or supplies. Uh, one who procures what is wanted. Well, what are some of the things that they need? Number one, they need earthly needs. That's my job. Now, some people will get angry at me because, well, I'm out of work, and so you're telling me I'm not, no, I'm not saying anything about that. But biblically, it's our job to be the earthly provider. That's what we have to do. We have to be that provider. First Timothy 5.8 goes on to say this, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's my job. I got to provide. I got to work. I got to get out and do those things. That's my job. Uh, we also need to not just provide earthly needs. We need to teach our children how to work. Wow. Work ethic. Is that something that's changed in our culture today? Work ethic? Whose fault is it? It's my job to train my child how to work. I'm the one that instills that work ethic. Huh. Lamentations 327. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. So when do we start? When they're young. That's when you start teaching how to do these things. Second Th uh, Thessalonians 3.10. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If any will not work, neither shall he eat. You want to get rid of half of the problems that we've got in our culture with welfare? Here it is, guys. You're not going to work? You're not going to eat. You don't have to work. I won't make you work. But don't come looking for a handout if you're not going to work. <sighs> Provider. Earthly needs. Teach your children how to work. And also understanding what work is. Man, this was a biggie for me. I'm being honest on this one. Work is God's design. It's one of the first things that he did. He creates Adam and Eve. What does he do with Adam and Eve? He gives them a job. First thing he does, creates them, puts them in the garden. Now you got a job, work. Hmm. Ecclesiastes 3, 12, 13. I know that nothing is better for them to rejoice and to do good in their lives and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It's a gift of God. It's a gift. Having a job is a gift. Go without one for a while. It's a gift. Hmm. So we provide earthly needs, but we also provide a godly environment. That includes, that includes in that godly environment, godly training. This is my job. I'm the spiritual head of the home, and it takes time to do that. I've got to do that. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. That's like the verse. Everybody jumps on that verse. There's the verse, right? Let's do some digging in that verse. So I, I, I found this interesting because I started looking at that. What's the word train mean? I've gotten really big on this over the last couple of years. You've got to look at the word, but then you've got to dig in, and what does the word really mean? Because there's so much more to it. We, we get kind of superficial in our reading. We'll just kind of skim through things. What does train mean? To initiate, to early instruct. Huh. As, and it goes on to say this. As soon as he is able to speak or go, even from his infancy, or his children are fed by little bits or a little at a time, as her mouths can receive it. So we've got to start the training when they're young, giving them a little bit, give them a little bit, give them a little bit, training them, teaching them so that I want them to understand these big, deep things up here. You've got to start down here. Build up, build up, build up, build up. That's my job, to do that. Um, in the way he should go, what does, what, does, what does that mean? The assumption is that it means in the way of righteousness and the, and the true religion, a, a, a course which all, both young and old, ought to follow, but this is not what Solomon meant here. This is some interesting stuff that I was able to, when I was digging on this. 
Because that's what I thought. Well, train them the right way to do it, and that's the way that it is. The Hebrew phrase used here means according to the tenor of his way. You know what that means? We've got to understand our children. We've got to understand what makes them tick because our children are unique. And I can't treat my son the same way that I treat my daughter. I learned that the hard way. Man, I blew that. I, I tried to discipline and teach my son the same way that I did my daughter, and it didn't work. They're 29 and 28 now, but boy, did I blow that. I, I just look back on it now. My daughter, uh, I was the guy, okay? I was like the eight-up basketball coach dad. And so uh, my children would come home from school. All right, we're out in the driveway. All right, pick, box, drop, step, hook. I mean, I'm out there doing drills with my children in the driveway, okay? My son loved it, flourished. Daughter, senior year in high school. The year that she's going to explode. She's having a great year. She's going to explode to really get the college scholarship, she quits. I'm not playing, Dad. I have no joy. I have no love in this. I blew it. My son went on to play college ball. Daughter, I'm done. That's what the Scripture's talking about there. We've got to learn our children. They are unique. I can't teach them and train them the same way. You know, we've got to understand what makes them tick as a father. Hmm. Ephesians 6, 4, and you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Provoke them to wrath. Whew, that's what I did, man. That's what I did. I blew it on that area. Colossians 3, 21, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Ooh, I dropped the ball on that one. So I'm not trying to stand up here in front of you and tell you like I'm the guy that has it all right. I really dropped the ball in some major areas. I'm just trying to teach some lessons that I got. Now, when he is old... We'll go back to Proverbs 22, 6. It goes on to say this, that when he is old, this does not mean that your children aren't going to reject the truth. You can do everything right. You can pour into your child. You can do everything right. And it doesn't mean that they're going to stay. It does not mean that. You can still lose them. But the likelihood is this, that if you've poured into them, you've done everything right, the likelihood is more that they're going to be there than they won't be there. Because ultimately it comes down to a personal decision that they have to make with Christ. And all I can do is give them the truth and pour into them. No, I'm going to skip that. Forgive me. I'm going to skip that. Second Timothy 3.15, and that from a childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So we've got to get them into the Scripture from the beginning, teaching them the Word, how to study the Word. So, providers, earthly needs, godly environment, example in faithfulness, example in faithfulness. This is a biggie uh, as well, I think, in our culture. What do I mean by example in faithfulness? Well, the first thing that we have to be an example in faithfulness is uh, faithful to our wives. Guys, think about our culture today. What's the divorce rate in the church? It's unbelievable. Infidelity in the church. Faithful to our wives. You know what struck me on this? My son is watching my relationship with my wife, and that's basically going to set a tone for what his relationship with his wife is. My daughter is watching me in my relationship with my wife, and that's setting the tone for what her relationship is going to be with her husband is. We have to be faithful to our wives. Ephesians 5.25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Wow. Love my wife enough to die for her. You know, um, I did this. This is how weird I am. I got into the Scripture, Ephesians 5, because I love that. I love this verse right here. It says, wives, submit to your own husbands. Man, I love that part. I love stressing that part. I really do. Get in a conversation with my wife. Submit to your own husband. I love that part. But, you know, then I did something else. I, started, I kept on reading. That part... That's for the ladies. That part, that's for the guys. This is how simple my mind is, okay? I just counted the words. There's 54 words of instruction for women. There's 174 words of instruction for men. Why in the world do we have almost three times as much instruction? Because it's our job to be the spiritual head. And when you're the leader, there's more responsibility on the leader. Or maybe it's because we're a bonehead, but I mean, either one. We've got a whole lot more instruction to us. And here's what hit me. If I did my part, 
If I do my part, maybe she can do her part. Make it a whole lot easier. It starts with me. Oh, it's not as bad as it looks, because take a look here. Uh, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So there's 10 words there. So subtract 10 words. It's actually 166 to 50, or 64 words. 164 to 64 words. So there's only 100 more words of instruction to the men. Still, it's our job. Protector and provider. Let me ask you this. Dads, should I as a father talk to, to my child about something that can destroy their eternal soul? Should I talk to my children about something like that? What do you think? Should I? I can't hear you. Sexual purity. Sexual purity. Malachi 2.32 says what? And did he not make one? Yet he had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed? One of the primary purposes for marriage is to have godly children? Think about it. Proverbs 6.32 says, Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. We better talk to our children about sexual purity. Because this is what bothers me. This is what really bothers me. Uh, Adultery on TV, adultery on TV depicted on television programs, tied back into that protect our children from TV. Adultery on TV outnumbers sex within the bounds of marriage, eight to one depictions, eight to one. All right? Now, let's keep going on this, though, because there's a report that came out on Happily Never After, and the report, I mean, when I started reading this, across the broadcast network, verbal references to non-marital sex outnumbered references to sex in context of marriage by nearly three to one. Scenes depicting or implying sex between non-married partners outnumbers uh, married partners four to one. The family hour, okay, the family hour, that's the safe time to watch TV, really? Uh, Time slot, with the largest audience of young viewers contain the highest fr- uh, frequency of references to non-marital sex as opposed to references to sex in a marriage of 3.9 to 1. Check this one out. References to incest, pedophilia, partner swapping, prostitution, threesomes, transsexual, transvestite, bestiality, necrophilia, combined outnumbered references to sex and marriage on NBC, 27 to 1. You don't think that this stuff, 1,064 hours of TV that we're letting into their eyes, into their minds isn't impacting them? According to one survey published in the Chicago Tribune, a a third of the youth 12 and older say the media encourages them to have sex. Guys, there's a battle going on. And if you're not talking to your child about sexuality and purity, the world is. And it's not a very good message that they're giving them. We've got to talk to them about these things. So we've got to protect them, we've got to provide. Faithful to your wife, but then there's another thing, faithful to your word. You know, the, I, I spent two months, I spent two months uh, in camps last year, and probably about a month and a half this year in camps with young, junior high and high school kids. The number one comment that I get from youth when they start coming up and asking me questions, I always ask them, do you talk to your parents about this? Do you talk to your father about this? No. Why not? They don't listen. He's there, but he doesn't, he, he's not there. He'll tell me that he'll do something, then he doesn't do it. Faithful to your word, gentlemen. If we tell our children we're going to do something, we do it. And if, yes, there are circumstances that break us down from being able to do those things, but then we go back to them and explain. And if we have to repent, we repent. We set the pattern. Our children see us, the way that we even handle the mistakes and the times that we can't do what we say that we, we're going to do. But I'm telling you right now, that was one of the major things that the youth told me. Dad doesn't do what he says he's going to do. What you see out here is not what I see at home. Number one, James 5, 12, but above above all, brethren, do not swear either by heaven or earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. If we say we're going to do something, man, we do it, or we make, give reasons why we can't. When we drop the ball, we deal with it, we set the example. Provider, faithful uh, to our wives, faithful to our word, and faithful in your work. Now, I'm not talking about physical work. We've already hit that one. I'm talking about the real work, not the secular work. I'm talking about our real work, and our real work is what? The spiritual heads of our homes. We've got to be faithful in that. Uh, You guys ever remember hearing a song? It's a few years old now. There's a song that the, 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 the dad said, Lord, I want to be just like you because he wants to be just like me. That, that song has resonated in my head for years. I don't, I don't even think that it plays on the radio anymore. But I want to be just like you. 
because he wants to be just like me. A holy example for his innocent eyes to see. Help me to be a living Bible Lord. This is weird. Isn't this weird that you can remember these things? You don't think that music, you don't think that TV has an impact? I still remember this. I'll be a living Bible. A living Bible. Wow. That's what I'm called to be. The example to my child. Protector, provider, priest. Now, this is the one that freaks everybody out. Priest, so you're getting ready to pull out the, the robes and the incense, and we're going to have all kind. Of, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a priest, a biblical priest. And you know what? The Scripture is very clear that we, gentlemen, are a royal priesthood. You get into Peter, it talks about that as living stones and being built up as a, a, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. That's us, the body of Christ, the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we're, we're royal priesthood, 1 Peter 2.9, Revelation 1.6, we're priests. So we are to be priests. What, what, what does a priest do? Hmm. Well, what does a priest do? Here's another little tool, dads. I love doing this one. 1828 Dictionary. It's free of charge on the internet. Just type in 1828 Dictionary in a Google search. Type in the word, any word. Type in the word love. Type in the word uh, science. Type in priest. And it's interesting. 1828 Dictionary. Check the definition there. Check it versus a definition today. In today's dictionary, totally different. Totally different. Terms have really redefined. So, in the modern church, a person who is set apart or consecrated to the ministry of the gospel. There you go. Gentlemen, sitting in here today, you know the Lord Jesus Christ? He's your Savior? You are a priest. Welcome to the priesthood. We've got to start living it. What should a priest do? Well, one of the primary responsibilities of a priest is what? Is to bring sinful people into a right relationship with God. And how do we do that? Proclaim. We have got to get busy in talking. How many, how many churches across the nation of America? Over 400,000, how many first-run theaters? Hunger Games has done more to initiate or indoctrinate this younger generation than 400,000 churches have? Why? Because where are the Christians in the world? Where are we? Turn on television if you dare. Finding, uh, Finding Nemo, watch a movie. Finding Nemo, Lilo and Stitch, Incredibles, Bob the Builder, Law and Order. They all have Christian characters on there. And by the way, oh, by the way, I love this one. Uh, Law and Order, if you see a Christian in there, they did it. Law and order, if there's a Christian, he did it. If he didn't do it, he's worse than the one that did do it. Christians, how are we depicted? What are we doing to overcome that stereotype? We're priests. We're set aside. We've got to proclaim. Um, how do you bring the sinful people into a right relationship with God? You've got to do the proclaiming because don't trust me. God said, 1 Peter 2.9, that you proclaim the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. There's another thing that we need to do. We need to pray. Ooh, there is power in prayer. You know that. So how do we pray for our children? I think there's a real good example on how we pray. And let's go to Job. Hmm. Job says this. Whoops, I went one too many. Went one too many. Forgive me. Got to take you to this because this is good. This is a good example on how we pray. Um, He goes on to say that you pray for your children by what? You rise up early in the morning for each one of them as an individual on a regular basis. There's how we pray for our children. There's a good example, a good biblical example. So proclaim, pray, and present. What do I mean by present? Lord, I want to be a holy example for his innocent eyes to see. I live it. I present myself to the Lord. You know, my pastor, my former pastor in Illinois, he adopted three children, I think it's three, and uh, one of the young men is now out of the house. He's gone down another road, and he was writing some stuff, and my pastor wrote this to him, and I thought I'd share this with you guys, because this was some, to me, some real wisdom. This is what my pastor wrote to the son that's made his decision to go down a different road. Boys play house, men build homes. Huh. Boys shack up, men get married. Boys make babies, men raise children. A boy won't raise his own children, a man will raise his child and someone else's. Boys invent excuses for failure, men produce strategies for success. Boys look for somebody to take care of them, men look for someone to take care of. Boys seek popularity, men demand respect and know how to give it. 
Boys do what they want. Men do what they can and more. Wow. So I got to be that living example. They're watching. You know, there's a, I want to show you a video here. Kind of a illustration. That little boy, they didn't tell him what to do when they were filming that. They just filmed him. Copying, copying. They see us, guys. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. It's our job. And it's time. It's time that we take, the, take it seriously. We become the protector, provider, and the priest of our homes. I'll end with this story. Um, Man, when I first got saved, I got saved May 15, 1987, and I'll never forget, it was a short time after that. My children were five, six, right in that range, and uh, I was an air traffic controller in Salt Lake City. I got saved, and I was getting ready to go to work one day. I'd taken a shower. I came out, and I started getting dressed, and on my dresser in my bedroom was a picture that sat on my room for a long time, and it was a picture of me with my daughter sitting on my lap outside of an, amu- uh, an amusement park. What a great picture. Dad loved his children enough, took them to the amusement park. Great day. The only problem is, is that picture was taken before I knew the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I saw that picture, I remembered exactly what I was thinking when the picture was taken. It was just like, bang, you know? And I was saying, this kid is heavy. I wish she would get off of me. I had my forearm in the small of her back, putting pressure on her to try to get her out of my lap. Dude, I broke. I broke, I'm telling you. I, I saw that, it was like, I am doing exactly to my children what I felt was done to me as a child. You're a burden, you're a hassle. I mean, I grew up with some pretty ugly stuff. Now, I never physically did anything to my children, and I never verbally did anything like that. But I built a wall up. There was a wall. Because it was like, I learned that if people get inside the wall, then they can hurt you. If they know who you are, they can hurt you. So you build up walls. And that's how you go through life. You have these walls, and all they have is a facade. And if they pick at the facade, they can't really hurt you. I fell on my face that day, and I said, God, I can't do this. I read somewhere, uh, I forget now, Exodus. I think it's Exodus. The sins of the father pass from the, uh, from the father to the children, one generation to the next, up to three generations. And I said, man, I am doing to my children exactly what was done to me. And I did. I repented. And my daughter, her senior year in high school, she paid me the greatest, the greatest compliment she could have ever paid me. We were having one of our conversations. My daughter is just like me, very strong-willed. So we had a lot of conversations, okay? And her conversation ended with, Dad, 24-7. You want to be around us 24-7? And I was like, yeah, and your point's what? But to go from, this kid is heavy, I wish you would get off of me, to Dad, 24-7? That's Jesus Christ. That's not Carl Kirby. Carl Kirby is the, get off of me. When we get a biblical perspective on who our children are, what our responsibilities are, maybe it will have an impact on our culture. Colossians tells us that we start 
in the house of the Lord, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. See, it starts with us, guys. It starts with us. And if we won't do it, I guarantee you this, the world can't do it. We've got to be the bright, shining light, the spiritual leaders of our homes. So I challenge you today to be that person, to love your children, to love your grandchildren, enough to spend time with them and to teach them. I thank you for letting me be here. This is kind of a negative downer message. I love doing the upbeat stuff, but sometimes I think we just got to, we got to get serious. There's a battle going on, man. So, Father, I thank you for the men that are here. They take time on a Saturday morning to come out and have breakfast. Lord, I would pray that you're going to break hearts. Have us repent if we put our emphasis in the wrong spots, if we've put our devotions and things that are so temporal and so fleshly that they're just not going to last. Help us to put our focus where it really counts, and that's on people, starting with our own families, getting our relationship with you right so that we can then be a bright, shining light to a culture that really needs to know that there's a different way. So, Lord, we turn it over to you. We trust you. We know that you will do great things through humble, fallen folks who say, here, my Lord, send me. So as we ask, the Lord, today that today you would send us. Put someone in our path that we can open our mouth with, share the faith, share the Lord uh, Jesus Christ with them, and help us to teach our children to do the same. And I thank you in Jesus' name for what you'll accomplish. Amen. Thank you for letting me be here. Turn over to David. Thank you.